Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome to my strange little YouTube channel. Now, if you're subscribed and you have been watching my videos for a while, you know that most of the videos that I do about cases are revolved around old Hollywood or celebrities in general, but I have decided to dive into more vintage cases that don't necessarily have to do with that. Today's video is all about the disappearance of an author. I got most of my information from the person's half-nephew. They became really fascinated by the case and they made a website dedicated to her, her entire backstory. They include a lot of family archives and personal entries from her and her diary and letters and it was just really interesting to research for. So yeah, with that being said, let's just get into it. A child prodigy, some classified her as a genius, who grew up to become a young woman that many thought was destined to become the next big writer of her time, only to completely vanish without a trace. Barbara Newhall Follett wrote beautifully mysterious stories and, ironically, her own story became just that. Barbara Newhall Follett was born on March 14, 1914 in Hanover, New Hampshire to parents Wilson Follett and Helen Follett. Roy Wilson Follett was a writer and a Harvard graduate who taught English at Dartmouth College when she was born. And Helen Thomas Follett was a writer as well, most known for her books revolving around her travels. Her parents, being so well educated themselves, figured that they would just school her from home, where she could be creative and be in her own environment and grow whichever way that she chose. The biggest turning point in Barbara's childhood was at four years old when she became absolutely fascinated by the clicking sound of her father's typewriter. This is where her love for writing began, and in no time, she began writing poems, short stories, and letters to people. She even had her own little study in their home in New Haven, Connecticut, and her father, who was now an editor at Yale University Press, would revise her writing and started teaching her simple grammar and punctuation. By the time she turned six years old, she finished The Life of the Spinning Wheel, The Rocking Horse, and The Rabbit, which was a 4,500-word short story. The story began with, Once upon a time, though I can't say exactly when, there lived in a far-off country a spinning wheel, a rocking horse, and a rabbit. They knew many of the people in that country. They lived in a house with many pretty things in it, such as I am going to tell you about. Amethysts, turquoises, opals, pearls, diamonds, and rubies, and precious stones of all kinds. Quite the vocabulary for a six-year-old. Barbara didn't have a lot of friends growing up. She was fond of animals, both real and stuffed, and had a vivid imagination. In 1922, she started writing down ideas of an imaginary planet she made up called Farxolia, and started developing an entire language for it. Through the years, Barbara's love for writing only grew and grew. She published her first book in January of 1927 at the age of 12 years old, titled The House Without Windows. It received critical acclaim, even from the New York Times. Her next novel, a memoir titled The Voyage of the Normandy, all about her experiences on a boat sailing the coast of Nova Scotia, was published a little over a year later in 1928, also becoming well-publicized and loved by many. 1928 seemed like a great year for Barbara, but it soon took a turn for the worse. Barbara's father was now in New York working as an editor, and he met a young secretary named Margaret Whipple. He was home less and less. Barbara sent him a letter asking him to come home for good because of how deeply she missed him. Two days after her 14th birthday, she received a letter back from him. And in that letter, he said that he wanted a divorce from her mother. This completely shattered Barbara. She wrote, My dreams are going through their death flurries. They are dying before the steel javelins and arrows of the world of time and money. His departure from her life caused Barbara to lose her passion for a short period of time. When she gained it back, it was stronger than ever, though. She convinced her mother that they were in need of an adventure at sea. They set sail from New York to Barbados with no plan, very little money, not much luggage, and no desire to be back in New York by winter for the harsh weather. 
they sailed all over from Tahiti to Fiji to Honolulu and they just kept sailing. Barbara and Helen started running low on money though and ended up in Pasadena, California where two very wealthy friends named Miss A. Brown and Miss Mildred Kennedy helped them out. They paid for Helen to return to Honolulu to work on her book about her travels and for Barbara to go to Pasadena Junior College, putting her in care of a guardian named Dr. Toole Schultz. Barbara was really excited to start school because she had never been to school before, but she soon absolutely hated it. And in September, she attempted to run away to San Francisco to live on her own and to become a typist. The police eventually tracked her down and this scandal even made headlines. In March of the next year, Helen and Barbara made their way back to the East Coast where they got an apartment in New York where Barbara started working on her third book called Lost Island. They then moved in 1931 to a cabin in Vermont where Barbara became friends with a group of students from Dartmouth College and she met a boy named Nickerson Rogers who she quickly fell in love with. Now Barbara actually fell in love with another boy while she was on her travels with her mother but when she met Nickerson she kind of disregarded him, stopped talking to him and only focused on Nickerson. As for Nickerson he was the outdoorsy type and Barbara absolutely loved that about him. They spent a lot of time in the wilderness, they traveled a lot and they eventually ended up in Massachusetts. Barbara developed a love for dancing and in the summer of 1939 she was enrolled in the Bennington School of the Dance. At this time she decided to visit her friend Alice Russell in Pasadena, California. During her visit she received a letter from Nickerson telling her to come home immediately. She got home on Tuesday and he didn't get home until Friday. When he got home they had a talk and she discovered that he was seeing another woman. This completely destroyed Barbara, but she blamed herself. She wrote a letter to Alice and in that letter it said, I think I've persuaded him to give me my chance. He is a very kind person, really, and hates to hurt people. He hated to write that letter, that's why it sounded so awful. I think that if I can really prove that I'm different, why maybe things will work out. He still doesn't quite believe, as he says, that a leopard can change its spots. By this time, Barbara had published a couple more books and she thought things were getting better, even finding a new apartment for her and Nickerson at 48 Kent Street in Brookline in Massachusetts, not far from Boston. On November 4th, she wrote her last letter to Alice saying, In my last letter, I told you things were going well, and I thought they were. They continued to go well for a time, at least, I thought so, and I was happy and decided that the worst part of the ordeal was over but that was too easy. No such luck. I don't know what to say now. On the surface, things are terribly, terribly calm and wrong, just as wrong as they can be. I am trying. We are both trying. I still think there's a chance that the outcome will be a happy one, but I would have to think that anyway in order to live, so you can draw any conclusions you like from that. A month later, on December 7th, 1939, her and Nickerson had an argument, and according to him, she walked out of the house with $30, her notebook, and was never seen again. Nickerson did not report her disappearance to police for two weeks, claiming he was waiting for her to return home. Four months after first notifying police, he issued a missing persons bulletin, but this missing persons bulletin was issued for Barbara Rogers, using his last name, her married name. So when it was issued, everyone who saw it had no idea that it was Barbara Newhall Follett, the critically acclaimed author. In 1952, Barbara's mother insisted they do more investigating into the case, but nothing was ever found. It wasn't until 1966 did the police find out more in detail of her disappearance due to the fact it was filed under her married name. Barbara's mother, Helen, became extremely suspicious of Nickerson because he really didn't put in much effort at all into finding his wife. And she wrote him saying, All of this silence on your part looks as if you had something to hide concerning Barbara's disappearance. You cannot believe that I shall sit idle during my last few years and not make whatever effort I can to find out whether Barr is alive or dead, whether perhaps she is in some institution suffering from amnesia or nervous breakdown. People speculated that possibly Nickerson had murdered her and hid her body somewhere, 
or that he put her in an insane asylum somewhere under a different name where she couldn't get out. Barbara's body was never found though, there was no evidence of foul play, and this case still remains open after all this time. No one has any idea what exactly happened to her when she walked out of that apartment that day in December of 1939. So I hope that you guys enjoyed that video. This is a case that I haven't seen really many people talk about on YouTube and I don't know why because it's a very interesting cold case. There's a lot to it and I have a lot of opinions on it and I know you guys are going to ask me what I think about it. There's not a ton of theories surrounding this case. There's only a few that are pretty obvious when you get to the end of the story which are that Nickerson had something to do with it whether he murdered her or put her in an insane asylum or that he led her to run away but I really just don't think she would have run away and just never seen her family again. Then there's the possibility that she got into an argument with him, left the house, and something else happened to her. Somebody else was involved with her disappearance. I mean it's just it's such a strange case. But definitely let me know what your opinion is about this case down below in the comments and leave any other recommendations for video ideas having to do with cold cases or just any ideas in general that you have for me down in the comments as well. I read every single comment and I will leave the website dedicated to her that her half nephew came out with down in the description for you guys to check out. It's really interesting. If you're interested in this case, definitely take a look at it. And I love you guys so much, and we'll see you guys in my next video. Bye, guys.